now is the welcome. So welcome to worship. And, uh, and what we're going to do this morning, we're, we're only going to do two songs. And where we would normally put uh, a, song, yeah, a song or two in the middle of the service, what we're going to do is we're going to take some time and, and use that for quiet time. Because so often worship is very busy and, you know, we're going on to the next thing and on to the next thing and we don't really get some time just to have some quiet time. Um, in a previous parish, I used to... Uh, some of the people used to take the sermon as some of the quiet time. Well, that's when they'd drop off. And, uh, and uh, so I'd have to talk a little bit louder. But uh, So we're just going to take that time and just reflect and, and use it as an opportunity to, to reflect on who we are as the people of Christ. Uh, so welcome to worship and welcome to Phil. Phil's with us this morning. He's, um, he's a member at, at Merthyr Road and, um, and we're glad you're with us this morning. Spread the love, Phil. Good on you. Let's come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have graced our lives with the life of Jesus and we rejoice that we are forever linked with him through baptism. This enables us to set our minds on Jesus as Lord and Saviour and to experience a newness of life which transcends all else. We are empowered to put to death all those things that oppose this new life in Christ. We confess, however, that there are still times when we set our minds on unworthy and ultimately destructive pursuits. Pursuits in which the need to acquire and possess threaten the selfless quality of life in Christ. When our attitude towards others is hostile and aggressive, we strip off the compassion that life in Christ possesses. When relationships are soured by the bitterness and jealousy, the joy of life in Christ reveals. When selfishness, uh, when we put others down through our prejudice and discrimination, when selfishness and greed contribute to our lifestyle, merciful God, reclothe us in the life of Christ and renew us in his image and knowledge so that the grace, humility and service which mark his life will be clearly visible in and experienced through our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. Everything old is passed away and everything has become new. All this from God to whom we have been reconciled through Christ. So rejoice, for in Christ we are forgiven, we are healed and we are renewed. And to that we say, thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And share the peace in whatever is appropriate to you. It could be a wave, it could be anything. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Kay's going to read for us. I'm reading from... Uh, oh, no, I'll read from the, the thing. Um, our first reading is from Colossians 3, 1 to 11. So, if you've been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Put to death, therefore. Be right. Set your minds on, on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, 
then you also will be revealed in, with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways that you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. This is a word from God. Thanks be to God. And from the Gospel of Luke 12, 13 to 21, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set, set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life did, does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Kay. This is a, uh, a reading that, um, that most of us in the West don't want to hear because it, it, it actually talks about putting our, our view of possessions into some type of perspective. I was reading a, a, a doctoral dissertation this week that someone had written on, on the effects of... Pauline theology, now that means stuff that, that Paul wrote. And what, it, what they were saying, their, uh, their thesis was that, was that when we engage in, in understanding Paul's theology, sometimes that gets in the way of understanding who Jesus really was and what was the message that Jesus came to offer. Because sometimes the interpretation of Paul's theology is about what you shouldn't do, what you can't do, what you won't do. Whereas Jesus didn't come at what, for one moment to say what you shouldn't do. Well he, well, he did. He said, you shouldn't not love people. You shouldn't be un, not peaceful. You shouldn't be involved in relationships that were going to fracture. You shouldn't... You sh and so what Jesus was talking about was about engaging in those things 
that, are, that contribute to the character of the Christian. And I think what we've done over 2,000 years is that we have, we have subjugated the church to a very Pauline understanding, but we haven't encouraged our people to follow an understanding of Christ. And understanding that in the centre of Christian theology is the cross. The cross which is about, which is about um, people being freed and engaged and being able to be useful. And so it comes, we come to this reading today which talks about um, possessions. And, um, and really, if a Jew had been listening to this reading... Uh, and even today a Jew would be listening to this reading and they would know that the person that asked the question, the, uh, the person that was sitting listening to Jesus, they asked the question, they said, tell my bro- Jesus, tell my brother that he is supposed to divide the inheritance. Because every single person that was sitting there would have known what the Levitical law would say, that on the death of the father... Two-thirds of the inheritance go to the older son and one-third to the younger, to the younger ones. And so they would have known that that's already set up. And so what Jesus has done here, he has actually pivoted and he is talking to this person and going, you know, why are you asking me this question? Because the law has already been set up. Are you asking me this question because because you want more or you want something that something that doesn't you're not really entitled to and so he changes he pivots the question and talks about greed which is fascinating because in this story what we do is that we we quite often take it oh you shouldn't store up things you know on earth we should store it up in heaven but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that just rolls off our tongue rather than us starting to come to any type of understanding on what that means. I, I, um, I came across a definition of greed. Greed is a logical result of the belief that there is no life after death. Because when you think about it, if we think about our, our existence as an eternity then what we have now is a very small part of that. And so why would we be interested in just that part? So if we think that the only part of us is is here on earth, then greed makes sense. But if we actually believe that we are people that are engaged in an eternity of relationship with God, then what we have now usually doesn't mean much. And so I really like that idea because what it does, it, it focuses back in on this, on this reading. What are you going to store up? And, and that's another slant on the reading. You know, you can store up the goods of the earth or you can store up these blessings from God. And quite often that gets confused too. And, um, and we all know of the churches that will say, yes, we store up the blessings from God and that will give us riches on earth. And, and that's a, an abstraction that really doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. Because what Jesus is saying here is pick the things that make a difference. Pick the things that engage us differently. So it, it follows on from the reading from last week, you know, where the guy goes next door and he starts knocking on the door, give me some bread, give me some bread. And eventually we know that the person gets up and gives him some bread. This one is, is about what's important to you. you know, and, and Jesus presents in the parable, he presents a quite a ridiculous notion. You know, oh, I, I've, got, um, I've got all this abundance, so I'll get rid of those barns and I'll build bigger barns. Well, if you've ever been on a farm, you'll know that that's ridiculous. They'll just add another one <laughs> and, uh, and they'll just keep on adding. But what's happening here is that we're actually being engaged to try to to put some sense around our understanding of what it means to be a part of of the faith, to be a part of of the Christian faith. What does it actually bring us to do? What What does it call us to be involved in? 
and that there's three things that I, that I pulled out of this parable that I really like, that I thought makes sense. The guy in the parable is a fool. He might, he might be very good at, uh, at, at farming. He might be very good at doing what he does in order to get this prosperity, but he's a fool. And I don't know about you, but, but this notion of, you know, we need this prosperity thing can be very strong in our psyche, particularly in the 21st century. It's, it's been fascinating going through the, uh, the retirement scenarios and thinking, oh dear, I've got to change all my understanding of money because it doesn't come in the way it used to. I've got to, but it certainly it can't go out the way it used to either. And so, and so that's so. When I read this, I'm thinking, oh, this sounds like a conversation with the financial controller, and um, who um, tells me what we can and can't do. Usually, it's what we can't do. But what we're talking about here is that this guy was a fool. He had four barns but an empty heart. He had four barns but an empty heart. He, he was prosperous but wasn't loving. He was prosperous and wasn't peaceful. He was prosperous but wasn't caring. See, there's, a, there's this... There's this difference between prosperity and having a life that is sustainable and worthwhile. And too often, people use wealth as an indicator. Oh, you know, um, money will make you happy. Well, I've known a lot of people that have, got, that have got a lot of money and I don't see them as that much happier. A lot of them are actually more engaged in acquiring more wealth. Secondly, the man was a fool because he overestimated his own value in the scheme of things. The value is not in what we have, but who we are. And so this, one, this comes back to the character of the Christian. And this is where the church and, and our faith has lost a lot of street cred over years because we haven't done the things that we say we're going to do. Because what we're trying to say is, oh, this is what we do, but people remember that the churches were more involved in child sexual abuse than they remember that we run a hospital and a home nursing service. Because, because they're, they're expected, but the child abuse was not expected. And so, and so we have to understand that our value is in who we are, not what we do. So we need to operate with integrity and with character. Our value is how we measure our compassion, not how we can stand over those around us, not about our own personal power, but how do we serve. And see, that's the notion that, that Jesus came to offer. And what we, have, what we have done so much in Western Christianity is we have focused on the action on the cross as being the ultimate way to, that, that we can receive God's forgiveness. Now, while that is true, another way is to look at the cross event is that Jesus served all of humanity by offering himself. And so part of what we are called to do is to offer ourselves to the world, to the people of the world to engage with them in ways that are significant and useful. And the third thing is this man was a fool because he forgot what his real business in life was really about. The real business in life is about serving our God and serving each other. Because that's the thing that's sustainable. I have a couple of stories that... that highlight this and one of the stories is a, is um and you've heard this story before phil so this is um this is about repetition for you <laughs> there was an old lady who used to be a member at wavell heights church her name was jean ferguson 
Jean was about this tall. She was English um, by, um, uh, by investment. <laughs> um, she, had, um, she had gone to that church at Wavell Heights from the time that she was a child when they moved to Australia. And, what she, and, and sh she was basically, when she grew uh, up, she, she started some um, kindergartens and she became the uh, principal of the Brisbane Kindergarten Teachers uh, College uh, that used to be at, at um, Calvin Grove. And she was the one that was the mover and shaker behind starting preschool education in Queensland. Jean was a very skilled preschool educator. But what people didn't know about Jean was that, um, was that she used to invite people to lunch every Sunday. She would lay the table for 12 people. She lived by herself. She was, she was an unmarried woman. And she would lay the table and she would put on the roast and, uh, and she would invite people from church every Sunday. 12 people at least sat around that table and ate with her. She served those people. That was her ministry. She did a lot of other things in her life, but that's the thing that, that happened. When she died, um, they were talking about, well, you know, we'll have the service at, at, um, at uh, Wavell Heights, but we probably won't get a lot of people because she'd been retired for a fair while and she was in her 80s. She used to drive this Morris Major had a ding on every single panel. And then when they took the licence off her, she just kept on driving. <laughs> she was, and she really hated the minister there at Wavell Heights because he dobbed her into the police. <laughs> but um, she was a terrible driver. But great preschool educator. Anyway, they thought there was going to be about 100 people would turn up at a funeral. 1,500 people turned up. People flew in from all over the world. And they started telling these stories about going to her place for lunch. And people would tell the story about that, that they went to her place for lunch every Sunday for 12 years because that was the only proper meal that they had each week. They would tell the story about when they came to Brisbane to study that Jean would invite them over to her place for lunch and they would come there. So for three years in a row they would go and they would have lunch with her. They told stories about how she would invite new people that came along to church for the first time and they would invite them for lunch. She t they told stories about how this, this quirky little woman would engage people in a way that was incredibly profound. It was her character. Her character of, of giving. They didn't talk about the menu they didn't talk about the quality of the food. They talked about the quality of the love and the care that she actually engaged them with. And when it comes down to this reading today that we look at, this parable, we look at in stark contrast to greed and compassion, to greed and us opening ourselves up. To, to the things that God calls us to do. There's a, uh, there's a story about a monkey in Africa called a ring-tailed monkey. And the ring-tailed monkey is, is uh, pretty agile and pretty quick. But um, it was starting to die out. And, um, and so a conservationist went in and tried to study why was this monkey, who actually should get away from everyone really easily, why was this monkey dying out? And they realised that it was human intervention, that the natives could actually capture that monkey really easily. Because what they would do is that they would cut a hole in, in a piece of fruit the size of the monkey putting their hand in, and then they would put some beans inside. So the monkey would go in and it would grab the beans, but it couldn't pull it out because your fist is bigger than when your hand goes in like that. They, they couldn't pull it out and they wouldn't let go of the beans. 
That's a true story, but it's actually a reflection of the parable that we humans are quite often people that will go in and grab hold of something but won't let it go. And in the end, it's a part of our demise. And so, so it's an incredible understanding of how we understand ourselves in eternity and how we understand ourselves as people of, of means. There's a guy named uh, Neil Holbrum. He's an economist. And, um, and he wrote an article uh, some years ago. And the article was, what is it like to live in the third world? And so he's written to people in the Western world. And he said, this is what it's like. Take the furniture out of your home, except for the table, a couple of chairs, a blanket, and some pads for beds. So take all that stuff out. He said, then take away all your clothing, except for, for one, suit, one lot of clothing and an old pair of shoes. Empty the pantry and the refrigerator, except for one small bag of flour, some sugar and salt, a few potatoes, some onions, and a dish of dried beans. Dismantle your bathroom. Shut off your running water and remove all the electrical wiring in your house. You getting the idea? Take away the house itself and move the family into the tool shed. Replace your house in a, place your house in a shanty town. Cancel all subscriptions to newspapers, magazines and book clubs. You don't need them anyway because you can't read. Leave only one radio for the whole of the shanty town. Move your nearest hospital or clinic 10 miles away and put a midwife in charge instead of the doctor. Throw away your bank books, credit cards, superannuation, insurance policies and leave your family cash as $10 in a, in a can. Give the head of a family a few acres to cultivate on which they can raise a few hundred dollars in cash crops and which one third will go to the landlord and one tenth to the money lenders lop 25 years off your life expectancy. And when you do all those things, you will start to understand what most of the people in the world live like. That we have been given so many things. And to those that are given many things, much is expected. We are expected to engage in the world, to be to be movers and shakers in a world that is not fair. We're not about bringing fair. We're about serving each other and serving God. And that's what comes to our faith. Someone asked John Rockefeller, who uh, was an oil baron in the US, how much money uh, will satisfy a person? And he said, always just a little bit more. Money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. And so we have to put our money and our possessions in a perspective. What are they given to us for? And how do we serve with them? What are we called to do? About 20 years ago, I was the um, director of stewardship for the assembly. And we, we did some research. And the research that we did was, how do people determine how much to give to the church? And, um, and also in the way that they give it. But the fascinating thing that came up with our research 20 years ago, and it hasn't changed a whole lot, is that people decided that they would give $10. And what the way that they made that decision was that the decision was made to be about the same amount that it cost to go to the movies. And so that decision had stayed the same, about $40 a month. It didn't matter whether you gave in envelopes or open plate, it was about $40 a month. Because what we have done is, is that we have equated our participation in the church like recreation. 
rather than, than we have engaged that this is a life-altering experience. And that's what we're involved in. We're involved in a faith that is a life-altering experience. Let's take some time. And you might like to close your eyes or focus on something close to you. You might like to reflect on your life and on the things that God has given you. might like to think about those things that you can offer to others to alleviate their hardship and their pain. You might reflect on your life of comfort and how you might bring comfort to others. Lord our God, we call on you to help us to engage in a life of sharing and caring, of giving, of service, a life that is rich in enabling other people. a life that brings joy to others and to ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. John, do you have any notices? Yes, have we got notices? I think there's um, sausage sizzle coming up at Bunnings. Oh, next week's service here again. And that's the first of the month, so it'll be communion. And if you can remember to bring some things for the community pantry, that would be good. We'd try and get those in the pantry out there. What's the next one, Des? Ah, Okay. <laughs> Coffee and chat. How did that go last Friday? Good. And I hope you solved, solved all the problems. Good. Uh, barbecue volunteers for the uh, chaplaincy um, sausage sizzle at Bunnings. That's next Saturday. Next Saturday is busy because we've got, I think we've got pizza night as well. Is that up there? There's nothing on pizza night. That's all right. So Ross is back in town. He's recovering from COVID. Um, what's the next one? No, that's it. But uh, as far as I know, there will be a pizza. Is, there will be pizza night next Sunday, um, Saturday, uh, unless it's raining. So, offering. Thank you. We will. Um if you uh, have offering that uh, we would normally give in an open plate, can you just give it to Howard, please? <laughs> and he'll sort it out. Um, well, that's what happened last week, so. <laughs> but let's pray. Oh Lord our God, take these gifts 
May they go places that need to hear the reassurance of your eternal optimism. And we ask that they be used to extend your kingdom. Amen. Let's pray our prayers for others. Gracious God, reconciling spirit and friend, we pray for those who don't think like we do, who hope for things that we dread, who reference and respect ideas that we would set aside. Call us into the difficult practice of love and acceptance. We pray for those who call us to account, who question things we hold true, who see salvation coming from a totally different direction and having very different outcomes. Call us into a difficult practice of love and acceptance. <laughs> we'll get it right, yes. Be with us as we travel into discussions and explorations with people whom we disagree, that as we speak our contested ideas that we may find a shared respect and mutual understanding despite our differences. Call us into this difficult practice of love and acceptance. Make out of us and of those with whom we converse a solid example of how to live with and to include those who are strange and alien to us. Amen. Let us pray for those that are known to us that are in need of God's healing mercies. Let us pray. Our Lord of God, we thank you that you love us and you care for us and we entrust those that are known to us that are in need of your healing mercies to be cared for with your compassion and your love. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn is in Christ alone. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Burn through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone, who took on flesh. 
hey, Phoebe, can you come and help me? Let us go into the world, embraced by God's love, reclothed with the life of Jesus Christ and built up with the riches of the Holy Spirit. we take our light into the world. Big breath. Hey. <laughs> and you're going to lead us out. So thank you, Phoebe. You're wonderful. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs> I'll give my, hey?